Today, I'd like to make an argument that cis straight people should care about queer stories. And yeah, it's a bit self serving because I write queer stories, but I also think that there's a lot that a cis heterosexual can get from a queer story that they won't find anywhere else. And I'm not just talking about same sex kissing. No, there's so much more to what makes a person queer than just that surface level that we still have to fight for in so many ways to get good representation of in TV and movies. No, there's a hidden depth, and that's what I want to talk to you about on today's episode of Project Shadow. I have something to say. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? My name is Charlie, you might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer and romance writer, C.E. Dorset. And today, I would like to talk about why it cis straight people should pay attention to queer stories. Because they could. Thank you for listening to today. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than that. And I kind of feel that it shouldn't have to be more than that, but it is. But before we get into all that... If you haven't already, please do take a moment to rate this podcast in whatever app you're listening to me on. It does help out a lot. It tells the algorithm to share the podcast with more people. The more people that listen, the bigger the community. The bigger the community, the better the chance we have of actually communicating with each other. And after all, that's why I do this in the first place. Thank you to everyone who's already done that. So, a little backstory. The reason I'm doing this episode today is because... I was on the phone with my mother the other day, and I told her that I was working on developing a new book, and she said to me, now, let's stop for a minute, because for any of my queer audience, you you need to understand, she's an older lady from a different generation who, whose entire life pretty much revolves around QVC, the Hallmark Channel, RFD, and content that was made prior to the 90s. Okay? So in her extremely supportive way, she said to me, oh, that's good. You've been writing a lot of gay stuff lately. This should give you a chance to expand to a bigger audience. (sighs) Oh, that, that, that got me going. But not to toot my own horn too much, I just kind of let silence fall between us for a little bit, and then continued on with a different topic, because at this point in our relationship, I know that there's nothing I can say to change her mind, and it it, it is what it is. She was meaning to be supportive, and I get that. It doesn't come across that way, but you have to know my mother. And I started thinking to myself, you know, it is so important for cis heterosexual people to encounter queer stories. And it's a shame that it's only a more recent phenomenon. And you may not think it's a recent phenomenon, especially if you're younger, but oh honey, I grew up in the eighties and the nineties. And yeah, it, for me, it seems like a minute has gone by since we finally, since Ellen, I I will never forget that day. (laughs) But a lot of people have not allowed themselves to experience stories from a queer perspective. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, to a lot of people, queerness is about who we kiss and who we make out with and who we have sex with. And that is not what queerness is. To me... I think it's possible to be straight and queer. I, th- I think that that's a possibility, and I- I've told several straight friends of mine that they are queer and they need to realize that. Because the fundamental thing that makes queer people different is not who we kiss or who our 
gender identity not matching the one that we were assigned at birth, or any of those things. What makes us queer is that unlike the mainstream of society, we've had to ask ourselves hard questions. We've had to ask ourselves questions that others would not have to ask because we were not the default. And this doesn't make us actually all that special. For a long time, if you were Black in America or Latino in America or, I'm sorry, Latinx, trying to get better about that, or any ethnic minority, and still it's hard to find good representation for you. And you've had to ask questions. That's what makes any minority fiction important. But as a white person, I can't speak to that experience, and I don't want to pretend to speak to that experience. So I'm only going to be talking about what it means to be queer. So, just so you know. But when you're growing up outside of the default for society, you start asking yourself all kinds of questions like, why don't I ever see anybody like me in the media? Is there something wrong with me? And that's a very important question. Is there something wrong with me? Because I think a lot of people believe that there is something wrong with somebody who isn't the default, who isn't normal. And that's an ingrained, inborn issue that we have. We love to set defaults. We love to set defaults for everything. The default volume for our television, for our phone. The default pages that open when we open our web browser. All of those, we love setting defaults. And we feel that when something is outside of that realm of experience, outside of that default, there must be something wrong. And we as a culture have created a default where being white, cis, and heterosexual, and let's be honest, male, is the default position that most media comes from. Now, there are beautiful outliers, and there have been a lot of changes over time, and that is a wonderful thing. Pose is a wonderful thing. Getting to see queer people of color tell honest stories is refreshing and wonderful and new. But it's still not the default. And to be honest, for all of the people who are afraid that one day it might be, it it, it won't be. Well, people of color will, I think, increasingly become the default as we merge and meld and become a better people, a much, much more integrated people. I think that that, that's inevitable. But as far as uh, queer stories, I I think they're always going to be a little bit outside the mainstream, just because we are a de facto minority. We're not, with the exception, unless, well, let me say it this way. Unless some of the studies that are coming out of England that showed that approximately 40% of younger people identify as bisexual or pansexual, if those numbers start holding out, then pansexual or bisexual may start becoming more of a default in media, but only time will tell. Because I really have a feeling that people that are exclusively heterosexual or exclusively homosexual are much more on the extremes, and most people probably fall somewhere in the middle, so that eventually might become more the default. But again, only time will tell. Over time, as you're growing up, seeing representations of people that are either unlike you or people who are like you being included in media for the sake of a joke, for the purpose of being mocked, it does something where you start questioning your worth, your value, and why you're different. Why are you so different? that people find it funny. Why? Think about it. In, back in the day, all a show had to do was make two straight men touch each other and then have a freakout moment about it. Friends was really bad about this. And people would laugh. They'd find it funny because, <laughs> like, they're gay. Really? Chandler Bing wasn't gay? Okay. 
Joey. Joey, Joey wasn't at least bisexual. Really? Okay. But still, I digress. Why is it funny? Because it violates the social norm. And anything that gets close to violating that social norm makes us feel like, oh, oh, I can't believe that happened. Oh, it's funny that you would even think that because of course they're not queer. Queers are other people. These are the heroes of our story. So of course they're not. That's not funny. It's not. It's a harmful, harmful thing. And luckily over the years, that's been going away. But growing up under that, whether it's high school kids ribbing each other because they think it's funny, or whatever the circumstances may be, it makes you start asking those hard questions. Why am I the way I am? And why do people think that's wrong? It's been said a million times that the unexamined life is not worth living. And if any group in this country and in this world has been forced to live an examined life, it is the queer community. We're constantly forced to explain ourselves, to justify ourselves, to fight for every little thing. And we don't even have that much yet. It's still legal to be fired for being queer. It's still legal to be kicked out of your house in a lot of places for being queer. Yeah, finally we can get married, and that's a wonderful thing. But we still don't have equality. We're still allowed to be the joke, to be the punchline. And there are people that believe, that honestly, sincerely believe, that it's their right to find people like us funny. Because we're freaks. We're deviants. Well, we're not deviants. We're deviations. We're outside the norm. But when you grow up in a society that treats you this way, that continues to treat you this way, you start asking yourself why. And in answering those questions, and I think most queer people have found their own versions of the answers to those questions, in struggling to find answers to those questions, we mine hidden qualities that most people will never find. We learn more about ourselves, about our humanity, about our ability to have compassion, our ability to care, our ability to love. We learn how powerful love is. Because honestly, don't you think it would be easier for us to just, if it were a choice, to choose not to be this way? To not go through all of the horrible things that I went through in high school? To not live in fear of people attacking and harassing me because I don't subscribe to the male gender that I was assigned at birth? Yes, that would be far easier. But it's not a choice. It is an identity. It is who we are. And in struggling to find the answers, in struggling to find the strength that we need to be ourselves, we tap deep reservoirs of all manner of emotion and compassion and strength that most people will never have to dig down and find. We discover things about our common and shared humanity that most people will never have to look for. We learn how to build communities because not everywhere we go, not everywhere we're born, has a place for us. We learn exactly how much of a mask our culture is, and we know how to perform in different circumstances. And in learning that art of performance, in learning all of the things that we have to learn, we see through the lies and the facades of this world, the things that this world takes way too seriously and believes are way too permanent, because we've learned it's a mask that we sometimes have to put on and sometimes take off. As we press against the gender norms that are placed on us, as we push against the 
relationship norms that are placed on us as we push against the various concepts in society that are part of that default construct. And we see it for what it is, a default construct, something that somebody came up with and that we unconsciously adopt over our lives. And we learned this art of performance, this per, these personas that are required for this space and that space and the other space. And I know a lot of people of color learn how to do this too. We examine the world and we see it through very different eyes. We know when we can talk a certain way. And in learning all of these things, in studying all of these things, which are things that we have to learn, things we have to study, things we have to adopt, practices we have to adopt for our own survival, our own mental health, our own well-being, we learn so much about the number of ways that we are forced to conform to unseen norms. And that's something that queer stories bring out. That's something that when we tell a truly queer story, we know how we have to act around our straight friends. We know how we can act around our other queer friends. For people who are both gay and trans, you know, one way of acting around your trans friends, and another way around your queer friends, and another way around your cis friends because the language that you share is different. The level of understanding is different. And we do this all the time. This code switching is such a natural part of our existence that most of us don't even realize we're doing it. We don't even know that it's something that we do until it's pointed out to us. Because it's just how you live. It's just how you survive. Or maybe you were lucky like I was and had somebody take you under their wing and teach it to you. These, all of these little things add up to such a rich tapestry that we perceive that most heterosexual cis people will never see. They don't understand how gender is a performance because they've never had to consciously perform gender. They don't understand how sexuality is a performance, how culture is a performance, how work life is a performance, because they've never had to code switch. They've never had to be careful how they talk, what mannerisms they use. All of these things are performances. They're masks that we put on and we take off with ease because we've learned them. We've been surrounded by them our entire lives, and they just seem so natural, so normal. They don't stick out to us. Unless you were forced to adopt them. And that, more than anything, is why cis straight people should pay attention to queer stories, and stories of people of color, for that matter. We have had to learn how to navigate a world that is not our own, a world that was not built for us, and a world that doesn't respect us when we are who we are. We have to know when to change our mannerisms and our voice. When I travel, it is not uncommon because I haven't had any of my facial hair removed yet. I hope one day to be able to afford that. And I'm not on any hormones. So it's not uncommon for me to let a small beard grow in because I'm six foot one. And I've had some encounters in bathrooms on the road that are not, not okay. So I will adopt a more masculine persona while we're traveling for my own safety. And it's not something that I like doing. It's not something I want to do. But it's a simple way to explain what I'm talking about. I have to lie and put on a mask so that when I'm driving through red state America, 
I will not be harassed by strangers. And this is what you learn when you listen to our stories. And so much more. So hopefully I've piqued your interest. If you are a uh, cis heterosexual person who has never thought that they should pay attention to queer stories. If you enjoyed this episode and you haven't already, please do take a moment to rate it in whatever app you're listening to me on. It does help out a lot. If you have any questions, comments, or topics you'd like to hear discussed on the show, down in the show notes, you'll find a link to my voice message system. Keep it short, keep it clean so I can use it on the show. I would love to hear from you. You can also hit me up on social media. I'm C. Dorson on both Twitter and Instagram. And you can find links to everything that I do over at projectshadow.com. If you've got a dollar that you can pass my way, in the show notes you'll find a link to both the voice message system and my Patreon. You really do help me keep the lights on. You help me pay for the software and equipment and my bills. And thank you so very, very much for all that you've done. If you don't have any money right now or you don't feel like giving, that's perfectly all right. But if you know somebody you think would like this podcast or anything that I do, please share it with them. That helps out more than you could possibly know. So, yeah, I hope this has opened your eyes to why you should care about queer stories, even if you're not queer. And until next time, don't forget to have the fun. Bye.